you might notice a small whirring sound coming from about here. We've got a deck and I'm capturing uh, about 80 hours of high quality HD footage from a pilot that I helped shoot about 10 years ago in Nepal and Thailand called A Dollar A Day. The pilot didn't really go anywhere, but I fell in love with the project so much that I acquired the rights uh, to the footage and to the two gentlemen who were in the pilot to begin releasing it on a distant signal here in the next couple of months. It's about two uh, friends who go on a journey through Nepal and Thailand on a dollar a day each. One dollar a day for seven days each, that's it. Uh, so we get to watch them lose like 15 pounds and worm their way through this incredible countryside with the nicest people in the most amazing landscapes you've ever seen. And uh, so in the next couple of months, we'll be having that uh, on the channel here. It's going to be amazing. And we've got a nice team assembled. Uh, the other bit of news is that uh, this little company, uh, this awesome company called Film Fervor, just released an interview that I did with them back, I believe, a year and a half ago or so, right when Milkshake was being released. It's about Milkshake. It's about filmmaking in general, my philosophy and my thoughts on filmmaking. So. Uh, that'll be here uh, right after this video and or this announcement and uh, that's about it. See you soon. Gonna go shoot the next darkness calls in the next week or two and hopefully we'll have some fun getting scared. That'll probably be coming out sometime in October for Halloween and get ready to get your uh, pants scared off. All right guys, catch you later. This is the Film Verber Podcast episode 102. Hello everyone, Justin Kincaid here, and I wanted to take a moment to tell you a few things about this episode. I originally recorded this episode back in mid-2015, and it was one of the few that was lost during a server switch when I changed my host to Libsyn. A lot of the file was corrupted, but I put together the best version of the interview here. Phil is an awesome creator with a great personality, and I'm really glad I was able to recover this episode. So let's get into it. Phil, thanks for being on the show today. Thanks, Justin, for having me. Uh, it's really my pleasure. So uh, we're talking a little bit about the show today, and I'd like to delve into your journey as a filmmaker and your inspirations to get in this crazy business. So all right, it's just it's it's hard for me to to quantify because I I can't think of anything else I'd like to do um, very much, and sometimes I can't remember why I'm here. So. <laughs> I don't know. You know, honestly, that is a very pure and very great answer. It's like, this is what I want to do. There's no bullshit behind it. This is what I want to do. Um, I mean, it's great. <laughs> yeah, I, I, I wanted to be scientist forever. I think we mentioned that in the pre, pre-game. And I, science fascinates me. Patterns fascinate me. Uh, the, the meaning to something fascinates me. And trying to, trying to get at some, the answers to big questions really intrigues me. And I think that, Film. I, I think that science is a is a fairly solitary profession. For, is sort of it's sort of um, what I gather about it. Although you're working with colleagues, it's you know you're doing experiments. It's very it's it's not as um, it's not as invigorating and collaborative as far as far as I could tell. Because I, I, I think the, the science that I wanted to do was studying whale migrations, and so I'd be on an ice ship somewhere in the middle of the Arctic tracking whale. Uh, locators with a couple of other guys for months at a time, and it, that just seemed very sad and lonely to me. And and I think that what was very exciting was that I could explore some deeper mysteries of the human experience in film, and and learn to communicate with people better. Because I think I've always had trouble communicating uh, from a, a young age, and it, being in film has allowed me to grow as a person and be able to communicate better and to dive into these deep questions of humanity without having to be in such a solitary, I think, profession or vocation. And so <clears throat> I just really like, uh, and I really love the collaborative process of, of filmmaking. I like being out doing something. I like the challenge of it. It's, it's ex- exceedingly difficult to make a good movie, a good anything. And um, I'm always disappointed when anything I make comes out even 
at 90% of what I intended. It's like, ugh, what is that one shot? And I didn't quite get right. And I think that that's what is most appealing about it is that if you can get it, if you can nail it, it's transformative and it communicates ideas to people that are difficult to to describe and, and you can make people feel. And I think that if you can do that in a genuine way, uh, you can really affect people's lives in a way that science does as well. And science affects people, but it's also very, it's very invisible. Right? It's a very invisible thing. I'm talking to you in this microphone. We're talking over the internet you know, via a lot of past science and engineering that makes all this process invisible. But with film, it's very it's very visible. It's very in front of your face. It makes you feel things, and I think that that um, is. That's what kind of keeps me coming back to making movies. Is if I can get that one moment right, then someone will feel that. And I think that that is, um, it's a powerful tool, uh, and it's it's exciting when it works. I have to tell you, um, as many episodes of this show as I've done so far, that has to be the best answer that I've had. And I'm not just saying that. That's that's a very awesome answer to that question. Thank you so much for that. <laughs> sure. Really, no, thank you. That's that's fantastic. Uh, so uh, tell us a little bit about your history in the filmmaking business, some of the things you've done, and what really got you started in uh, you know your successful part of the career. Ooh, successful is that? A, is that a, can we use that word? I um, why not? I don't know. Sometimes I don't feel like I've I, I don't know. I've made it right. I've I've made it. There's my DP friend uh, Bennett Surf, who shot the last episode of Milkshake. We were just hanging out one day, and he said, uh, "You know, Phil, you know we've made it, right?" I said, what do you mean? He said, everyone else that we went to school with has moved, has left. It's like, I think our entire class, except maybe one or two others, have just abandoned it. They've gone to get jobs doing other things because it's just that difficult. Um, and so it began with me doing PA work. I think that that's the, the bottom of the bottom, uh, getting paid cash from some very strange anonymous Korean companies coming in to do music videos, carrying, I, I, sw- I swear to God, I, Bags of money. That's that's how I got I got started out here. Was I came out? I got a job working for a Korean music video with this carrying around bags of cash, paying us to do whatever. And um, my, my first introduction was cleaning uh, an alleyway in downtown LA when it was very dangerous still here. And it was um, I think we had to kick out homeless people who still had needles of heroin in their arms. And so that wow. was that was a very sobering moment. Like, oh, we we are invading people's lives with when we're making movies, and I, I never I never realized that. And um, and then from there, I I, I appeared for quite a long time, it, well, far too long than I should have, because I, I didn't really understand that. Uh, in order to make it in the film business, you had to be entrepreneurial, uh, or at least you had to take a lot of risk. And so um, I wasn't sure what to do, and. Uh, I think I was 25 and I was still PAing after four years of being out here. And uh, I didn't like anything else. I didn't want to do anything else except write and direct and produce. And I, I don't know, it just occurred to me one day. It's like, well, what is the biggest lesson that one of my heroes growing up said? Uh, I think it was George Lucas who said, uh, if you have a camera, you can make a movie. And the only thing stopping you from making a movie is really yourself. And I said, oh, okay, well. He didn't say that to me personally. That's a, from a story that he relayed to somebody else. I forget what the story was now. But um, I said, well, okay, I've got to make a movie. And so at 25, I made my first film out here called The Chase, and I got into AFI Dallas Film Festival. It was only a minute and 20 seconds long, and I got to play alongside some other very, very nice films. And I think that when I told people who were there who'd, who'd spent like you know $2 million making their movie or – half a million bucks making their feature. They're like, oh, what movie did you do? I said, I did a, a minute a minute long short film. It played in between these two short films. That's like a bumper. And they're like, what? They were so they were so disappointed. <laughs> and yeah. uh, and that, I had a, a small amount of success with that. And it was a long time in between I'm m- making that and another one because it was so expensive. We actually shot on 35 millimeter film. And from there I began, um, there, was, there was a period of time where I just didn't work for about six months, and I called my friend Tony up, uh, who I went to high school with, who was the same guy I, I mentioned earlier about one of three friends who went into film. And he was directing Big Brother, and I said, man, I don't care. I don't, it's fine, reality TV, I don't care. Uh, I'll do whatever. And uh, so he got me in doing camera work for, uh, for Big Brother, and I moved over. And I was, I was, I was, it, 
very good at it. I was really, really good at coloring in real time and, and composing camera shots robotically. And I moved over to directing soon after that. And then from there, it's been pretty much all directing slash um, robotic camera or coloring. And then um, after the coloring and robotic camera dried up, I moved over to just strictly directing and producing. So now I've been directing and producing reality TV for a while, mostly in multicam studio situations where there's 50 cameras. So I've, I have I've a resume where I can direct up to 75 cameras. Um, That's uh, pretty impressive. It's pretty insane. Uh, I don't, I don't yeah. do as much anymore because I wanted to get away from that because there's sort of a glass ceiling. Not a, uh, glass ceiling's not the right word. There's sort of a ceiling with uh, how how high you can go. It's not very creative, and so I need, knew and then I needed to go in more creative direction, so I moved into story producing because eventually you can become an, a, an executive and dictate story. And um, I, I don't mean like a, as a, like actually a dictator, but you have, a, you have your hand is much more inside the story pot, and you can swirl it around a lot more than you would if you were just a cameraman or even the director. Directors in reality TV have very little control as to what's happening story wise and so oh really yeah very very little um the, the um it's the producers who have all the power and control so i decided to go along that path to see how that worked out it's been it's been going well i've been rising the ranks fairly quickly and um, I decided that I still wanted to be a director and produce my own stuff and wanted to liberate myself from reality television cuz it's not I, I just don't want to be the guy who does reality TV because eventually things are going to change, uh, and they change very, 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 very quickly in the film industry. So eventually, you know, reality TV went from pure reality verite to soft scripted, and now we're seeing a hunger for really good scripted shows. And so I, I want to be prepared for, for that. And so I have to keep developing my skills, and that's probably what's pushed me to become a better director and to make more stuff was to enhance my skill set. In the in the industry, and now here we are making milkshake because I I realized I needed to make a lot more much more quickly, and I didn't I didn't want to compromise by making just I don't know video blog style black box theater on a webcam, which is what a lot of what uh, YouTube shows are. They're very black boxy. Um, we just have the one camera and people move in and out of that one static frame, and I just think that YouTube can be so much more than that, and so I. Uh, I decided to make milkshake so I can make essentially ten short films in about a year, which takes taken about a year and a half now. But uh, and it, it's been a success. I only have one more day to shoot for to finish episode ten, and then I should just have, be able to edit the last three episodes and complete a couple little VFX shots, and then I'll have done. I'll have directed either a a feature film if you string them out all together, or ten very high quality episodes of of television, uh, as far as I I consider it. For the people who are not familiar with Milkshake, uh, kind of tell us a little bit about the story and what's going on in, in the episode. What Tell us about the show. Milkshake is about two friends who one night had a milkshake that they can't remember, and it was a life-changing milkshake. It was the most delicious concoction of milk and ice cream they'd ever had, but now they can't rem- remember where it where they had it, and so now they go on a weekly quest to try to find out where it was. Uh, so, so these guys who are who were stoned are now trying to find this milkshake on a weekly quest. And in that way, it's a little bit like Harold Kumar. And then um, they go through their several adventures uh, in, in, in the process, they grow up as friends together because they're sort of like, they're sort of millennials. They're sort of been they're sort of children in a way where they, they haven't really grown up and to become adults yet. And they haven't really been faced with a, a serious problem, which hopefully, which hopefully by the end of, of the episodes, we get to that point where they've both faced a serious personal crisis and they come out on the other end different for it. And that um, that's the gist of it, more or less. Uh, and it was inspired by uh, American Graffiti. So that, that's, that, that's probably the main reason why they're in Cars is I, I love that movie. And I thought, you know, I want to. I want to make something like that again because I just haven't seen anything like that. And I, you know, I, I just as much as I actually like Fast and Furious, <laughs> there isn't much going on as far as character is concerned. And I wanted to try to get back to that 1970s um, be- beauty of uh, beautiful filmmaking where it's just about these two people and learning from each other. 
So I, I actually like the uh, the reference that you made to American Graffiti because when I was watching the show Milkshake, I actually did feel a lot of that sort of style back to it, through back to the to the old days of uh, the the kind of cars and just the kind of feeling that you get going around the city. Tell us a little bit about why you decided to film in the car and you know how the process was to actually film inside of a car for the entire time. I thought it was going to be much easier. Let's start there. I remember when I was coming up with the idea, I said to my friend who I was sort of brainstorming with, I said, oh my God, it'll be so easy. We'll just get two LED lights. I'll sit in the passenger seat. I'll shoot the guy driving. La, 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 la. I'll get in the back seat. And, uh, oh my God, it just was so hard, so much harder than I anticipated because we didn't have police officers to uh, to block traffic because none of this was shot with permits uh, in order to keep the cost low. I think because I think it would have cost me tens of thousands to make to make it because I couldn't shoot it all at once. So I'd have to get I'd have to get at least I, I don't know, maybe maybe 18 or 20 permits and at, at about a thousand bucks or more each. I, I just would never been able to afford to do it. So we had to I had to contend with traffic and street lights. And that just slowed everything way, way, way down. And then also um, the fact that shooting inside of a Mini Cooper is very difficult, especially when you don't have a follow car. So I had to squeeze into the corner. I had equipment that I was carrying around. Uh, changing lenses was hard. Um, I had to monitor audio as well as video because I didn't have a crew. And so it was just me shooting and recording everything. I had to light it. And so it just it slowed everything down. And so it just took a lot a lot more effort than I thought it was going to take. But in, as far as like specific blocking, the one thing that I discovered that was very helpful was that the 180-degree line doesn't always matter when it comes to shooting. We all kind of know where the driver's seat is since we're all – we're in America, and we all know that – we know the configuration of a car, so we have a general idea of where everyone's sitting. That liberated me to shoot almost wherever I wanted to shoot in the car. So you'll see that as you're shooting as, – as the story goes along, we go from the back seat to the front seat. We go to French over the shoulder. We'll go to a three-shot outside the car. We'll go to behind the car because we all know the orientation of the car, and so that was very that was very helpful. What was most difficult also was trying to keep the line correct when they were talking to each other, if they were in the, if our two characters were in the front seat, so because I can't do a follow car, I couldn't shoot on either the left or the right side of the car, outside the car, in order to get that nice line of sight between two characters looking at each other. So often, right. what I have to do is, if I want a close up of our main, our our co star who's in the passenger seat, and to look, have him look at Drake who's in the driver's seat, typically. I had to put Lance in the back seat and sheath him as though he was in the front seat and then just make the eye line correct. So in episode, I don't know, one through four, whenever Lance, we have a, uh, whenever we have a tight close up on Lance in the passenger seat, that's the back seat. Uh, okay. It, it was because uh, I couldn't sit in the driver's seat and shoot him, right? Otherwise, the, otherwise everything, the, the background sl- stops moving. Sure. But I didn't want to green screen it. So that was um, that was my solution to that was in, to keep the, the 180 line proper when they were talking to each other. If I if I if I want a close up, mind you, I have to go to the back seat and cheat it. So that was difficult. Um, and then I, I knew that I wanted to shoot outside the car, which also made things exceptionally difficult because I had to I had to coordinate a follow car and that was it wasn't always possible to get one so I had to usually have an extra night for pickups and follow shots and so that was it that that way I could establish geography if I needed to inside the car and also be able to see the city to see the city to feel the city to feel like these people are actually going out uh, cuz that was uh, one of the big objectives was to make was to free the, the the webisode up from the confines of two people sitting in a in a tra- in a chair or in a parked car or was just to make it everything always be moving, and I just and that so I needed an extra day in order to do follow shots, and uh, that was difficult to coordinate. I didn't have walkie talkies, I'd use cell phones, and it wasn't always effective. And we had to just pick, we had to make a route, so we'd say we're going to go in a four block radius, and we'd take this route in a big square, making right turns all the time. And I would try to, I would try to follow that same route every time, even if I was in the car shooting the scene. 
and or when I was doing the follow shots. Does that make sense? Yeah, absolutely. And did you concern yourself at all with the outside uh, continuity of what you had to see? Because I can understand doing it in a live sort of setting like that where you're not really in control of the background. That'd be kind of difficult. No, no, no. If, you, if you're if you really astute observer, if, you, if you're watching outside the background and you know Los Angeles, you'll see like in one second, uh, there's a, there's a uh, Ralph's on Sunset. It's called We call it Rock and Roll Ralph's here because it's on Sunset. So in one second, it'll be Rock and Roll Ralphs out the window. The next minute, you'll see Melrose. And the next second, you'll see Santa Monica. I, I didn't – that was too difficult to do without um, the proper authorities giving us a, a fixed path where the same line can happen in the same moment. So that was, yeah. it just it, – and, and also, it wasn't necessary to the story that that specific geography was mentioned. So I could, I could abandon that um, – that constraint. I think that's important for a lot of people that might want to try to replicate this kind of uh, driving in the cars and everything like that. You know, the background, if it's not important to your story, don't worry about it. I mean, nobody's going to care. You know, it, it's just not going to matter. I mean, it does matter if, say, in one second he's in a city and then he's in a forest because then you, you could tell, right? You could, you could, you could tell that. And that, that, sorry, that, that's usually a qualifier that signifies that something's changed in the story. There is the risk mind you, of um, you, 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 of course, want to do something that isn't dangerous. So if you're just driving along, you're doing a scene, fine. Uh, it's, it's prohibitively expensive to do driving stuff. And you, cause you, need, you need two to three police officers at least, and you need to submit a route. And I, I got permits for one day just for locations here, and it was, a, it was about a 1000 bucks, and they, it did nothing. I, they, they put up slips on the door, and I, I'm just furious at the at the permit process here in LA, it's so expensive that if you're just a small guy spending your money, they will clean you out if you try to do permits. It's um it's cost prohibitive and it's meant to make sure that uh, people with su- sufficient resources can make movies. So if you got money, great, you can play. If not, then you can go to hell. Well, that's that's uh, pretty much everywhere, unfortunately, that I'm I'm finding that out, um, especially in the UK. I mean, there's not a there's there's really little. Um, support for the independent movie uh, market over there, which is kind of sad. So if you can, tell us a little bit about how you found your talent, how you went and found the actors and everybody that you um, you cast on the show. Uh, I actually work with Danny, who plays Lance every day. He is in development over at Painless Television, who produces uh, The Dead Files for Travel Channel. And I just thought he was really talented. There was something about him I just, I thought he could do it. And um, with... Uh, Ned, who plays Drake, he was the first person who came in and, and auditioned for the role. I think I think he just moved from Chicago and he just got out of UCB uh, theater. And we auditioned about ten to twenty people. I forget. He was the first one, and I thought that he just had the look. Uh, he was funny and he was intelligent, uh, and uh, that's how I found our two main characters. The ladies uh, in episode three and four, I know Colleen, the blonde who plays Melody. And I met her other friends there, Nikita and uh, Callie Cook, who play uh, her other friends. And I cast Claudia Graff, who plays the dream girl for Lance. And um, she's she's a, a really good actress. Typically, she does modeling. Uh, very beautiful, very tall, and very good. And she speaks German, so I think she was, she's been in Germany for the last few months, I think. And that's been the general gist of it. Usually, I, I find people that I have worked with. Um, and if it's a specific role, I, I cast it. Like if I can't find that person in my personal contacts, I'll I'll go cast. Um, and I really enjoy casting. It's fun to see. It's fun and depressing, but it's it's really fun because you get to you get to be you get to practice being a director, which is great. And you learn a lot of lessons. And I think my biggest lesson for casting was that you should cast to type. I think that there's this myth that directors. I'm sure there are there are a few for sure, but in general, um, that as a director you're supposed to be able to pull this performance out of somebody, and I and I just think that's a load of crap. I think that most people are cast to type, so I need the guy who is who looks like this and who can who has a certain presence, and maybe it's not who you originally intended, but you just you know that he'll fit, and you don't want to you don't want to get somebody who is. Definitely not what you want, and you and you're sort of under these illusions that you can make him and mold him into something that he isn't. Like if you if you got a guy who's very quiet and shy, he's not going to be the guy who's going to be very boisterous and 
affable in your picture. He's definitely going to be the guy who plays a shy type. Uh, Ned is he is um, very gregarious and very uh, very he's a pleasure to work with, typically, uh, and he's very funny and he's in, he does a lot of BuzzFeed videos and you can tell he's just he's outgoing. He's, he wants to be on camera. Same with Danny and I needed two people who were just like that who just were comfortable performing in front of an audience because we were going to be on the street and, and the, I needed someone who could knew, know their lines and not, not need a lot of help and someone who could give me big performances and um, so I cast the type. I think that that was my biggest lesson um, when I began casting years ago was uh, and I use that. I use that all the time. And if it's someone who's just not quite right or if he's too shy or if I'm looking for somebody who's shy but he's he's got a really big personality, I I probably just won't use him or her. Well, I think that's I think that's kind of important. I mean, you you can't get blood from a stone. I mean, you just you can't coach something that doesn't exist in the person really. But it's also it's also I mean, it's possible that you can. There are directors who do do that. It's just that it's it's not what I want to do because then you're 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 telling you're making a different movie, and in those movies it's very character driven. They take a very long time. They're usually you know in a in a couple of rooms, and you've got a lot of time to work with that person. And when you're making a movie that has a little bit of money and very little time, you you have to find out ways of being more efficient. And that's just one way of being incredibly efficient with your talent is uh, is just casting the type. Yeah, I, I I do like that. Um, you know, if you have a 16 to 18 month shoot schedule, I guess you can go ahead and coach people to you know to make them what you want them to be, if you want that particular actor. But you know, and and definitely in the indie market, you have to sort of be able to plan that ahead of time. I think, right? Uh, yeah. Um, yeah, cause a 16 month shooting schedule. I don't know who. It's like a Star Wars shooting schedule. Uh, sure. Um, yeah, and I, but I think even them. I think even they will cast the type typically. It, I think it's just it, it's the style of of movie. Like if you this was a, uh, I was just watching a movie called Detached last night with my girlfriend, and that's the kind of movie that you can probably spend some time with people you don't really know to try to get some performances out of them because it's very very small and it's about kind of trying to find the real people to play these parts who, you know, maybe not by actors per se. And you can kind of get that feeling that there's some actors that are very professional, like Adrian Brody and Christ, uh, Christina Hendricks. Then you have all, a lot of other young kids who I, I'm pretty sure aren't, aren't actors and they just, they're in it. Um, uh, and that's the kind of sense you get. I think that's, that's the style of movie you want it. You want it to feel amateur. I think you have to just like, I guess in that, I guess in that way you're casting the type as well. Uh, so I guess it's just, maybe that's just my, uh, Hard and fast rule for her casting. I don't know. Well, I, I like that. That's great. I mean, you know, that that really does work for you. And on the subject of cast, um, if you could have your dream cast in your next films and features, who would it be and why? And it doesn't matter if they're alive or dead. Oh, God, I have no idea. I don't know. I'm not entirely certain, certain what. I have a couple projects coming up. I think I think that uh, there's an act that I always come back to, and it's it's Tom Jane. I I just think he's wonderful he's, he uh he can go from being a a real sob on screen drunk cocky bastard to a very sensitive father type figure i, I just think he's a wonderful actor and he gets he, he's, he's in a lot of movies i i, I just wish i, I want to see more of him i don't know what it is about him i love him he's great um who's another actor oh christopher walken i think is probably on everyone's list because he oh, of course he could <laughs> read a grocery list and you'd be like yes yeah i want i want a cheeseburger i, I want that ground beef you're talking about it's just no matter it sounds really good i don't know what it is it does it does uh, i'm trying to think of any female or other male actors i want to work with i mean there's a bunch i mean you, I, I see them all the time and it's like oh i just would love to work with that person and i always forget them later I just I don't know what it is. Uh, they're, they're definitely actors I've heard not to work with often, but um, and, and they stick in my mind whenever I hear their names come up. Um, but yeah, Tom Jane for some reason I've wanted to cast him in a couple of movies that I've written, and it always comes back to like oh, I want to work with Tom Jane. And um, so I'm, I, I wrote a noir uh, that I'm gonna it's gonna be one of my next projects. I think I'm gonna do a feature outside of doing some more webisodic stuff, and I would love to get it to him somehow. I think he'd be great. We're getting to the the terminal point of this, so um, uh, just to wrap up real quick, just summarize the uh, the the kind of the plot and log line of the noir film, and then we'll move into the outro. Okay. Okay. Um, so Irreplaceable is about a washed up, 
bounty hunter who is forced to capture a woman who looks just like his dead wife. And through a series of complications, she offers him a chance at making a lot of money in order to take care of his father with a subtle hint that maybe, of course, he could have his old life back. And uh, to complicate matters again, there's someone who's after her to kill her for st- what, what she's stolen. And, of course, he has to protect her. And it, the gist of the, the journey of the character is that hopefully he will learn to stand on his own two feet and move on from his dead wife and reject this pale imitation of, of, the, of the woman he once loved. Well, that sounds really awesome. Is that novel still available? Yeah, it's called Irreplaceable. You can find it on the Amazon Kindle store. Excellent. We will definitely provide um, uh, some notes down to that into the show notes and links for that. Um, so, yeah, thanks so much for being on the show today. Uh, it's it's a little bit a little bit over time for um, our normal budget of time, but that's okay because we've had a little bit of uh, issues with uh, connectivity. But it's been a really great story, and I I recommend and urge everybody to go check out Milkshake. You can find it in the show notes here. You can go on Vimeo. Um, and real quick, Phil, uh, what's your website and where can people find you? You can find me at uh, you, sorry, you can find me at philabaticola.com and you can also find me at uh, thesignalisstrong.com and then you, that's where you can find all of my projects. Also, I'm on YouTube and Vimeo. And I'm everywhere. And my name will be in the, in the show notes because it's hard to spell. Yeah, no problem with that. Uh, we will definitely put it out there. Uh, Phil, thanks for being on the show. I've had a really great time and I learned a lot about talking to you too. Thanks a lot, Justin.